Bloom from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to ESP32 Sleep Modes and Power Consumption. And this will be part one in a two-part series. Before I get started, I'll just mention, please support Forstronics on Patreon, where you can find exclusive content. And there'll be some exclusive content from this video series. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Forstronics YouTube channel. And if you like what you see here, please hit the thumbs up. All right, let's get started. Okay, this is going to be a two-part series. I'm going to have a different name for each video. So in this first one, ESP32 Sleep Modes and Power Consumption, I'm going to talk about the different sleep modes that are supported by the ESP32. What are some of the wake-up sources you can use to get them out of sleep mode? What is some of the spec current consumption? And then we'll talk about how we can measure real low-level current with a circuit and the ESP32. Specifically, I'm going to be using the ESP32. 32S3 variant, so keep that in mind. And then we'll look at a demo where we'll capture and make current measurements in light and deep sleep modes, which we'll talk about more. And then in part two, we're really gonna focus on the code, right? So what are the different functions from the API to enable light and deep sleep? How can we configure different wake up sources? And then we'll review the code in part two. Okay, we have four main sleep modes for the ESP32. And once again, this is on the S3 variant. One thing I'll mention before I jump into this is I used basically four sources of documentation for this information. I used the ESP32 S3 data sheet for the module. And when I say module, I mean the little circuit board that has the metal cover and an antenna on it. And then I also looked at the ESP32 S3 series of ICs, that data sheet. And then I also looked at the API for the sleep modes. And then I also looked at the API for the power management functions. So those were my main sources of documentation for putting together this information. And the reason I'm letting you know that is Expressif, which is the company that makes the ESP32, and I, I like their products, they're not very great on documentation. A lot of their wording and what they call some of the sleep modes varies from document to document. So just keep that in mind if you're looking at those documents. All right, enough about that. One of the main sleep modes is deep sleep. So in deep sleep, almost all the modules in the SP32 are off, except for the RTC modules, the real-time clock modules, and the ULP coprocessor, which stands for Ultra Low Power Processor. Now, the RTC is a real-time clock, which the SP32 has, but they use that term RTC as an umbrella that covers a little more functions than just the real-time clock. So the RTC module has functions where it can read pin states as well as pins with touchpad functions. So just keep that in mind. They use that RTC term to cover more functionality than what traditionally is referred to as the RTC or real-time clock. The ULP coprocessor is actually a really cool function. I'm not going to be able to cover it in this video series. Maybe a future one, but this is, it's actually a tiny microcontroller inside the microcontroller. So if you combine the RTC with the ELP coprocessor, you can actually write other code that runs in deep sleep mode. And this is code that's based on assembly language, if you're familiar with assembly language. I, that's beyond the scope of this video, but just be aware that these are the modules, the only modules that are awake during deep sleep. The ESP32's deep sleep is great because it has very low current consumption, which we'll see in a bit. But when you wake up from deep sleep, it's not like you wake up where you left off in your code and it just keeps running. That's what I'm used to with most microcontrollers. The ESP32, though, in deep sleep actually acts like a reset when you wake up. So you start, if you're familiar with Arduino or you use Arduino, you start, once again, in your setup function and run through your setup and go back to your loop. So it's almost like a reset. The difference is though is global variables are maintained. So in your setup code, if you wanna to check to make sure you're not, if you're starting from power up or if you're starting from wake up, you can use global variables to signal that so you know. Next we have light sleep. In light sleep, we have some more things that are left on. The CPU is clock gated and we also have more options for wake up sources. Also in light sleep, when you wake up, you're waking up where you left off in the code. So wherever you said, okay, go into light sleep, when you wake up, you're gonna continue in the code in that location. But of course the trade-off is, is light sleep is, uses multiple orders of magnitude more current than deep sleep. Next you have hibernate, which is one of those terms that uh, is not consistent through the documentation. 
But Hibernate is just deep sleep with the RTC memory powered on, but the RTC peripherals, the ability to read a touch pin or a logic change on a pin, that's powered off. So that's that's the only difference between Hibernate and deep sleep. And then automatic light slash modem sleep. Once again, this is where I saw different words used for this functionality. This to me is not actually a sleep mode. It's a nice feature, but you don't actually go to sleep. It's just the ability to change the clock frequency on the CPU. So you could do a slower clock frequency, therefore you consume less power. It also allows you to closer manage the wireless capabilities for lower power operation. And unlike light sleep and deep sleep, automatic light sleep or modem light sleep or modem sleep allows you to maintain wireless connection. So if you have an active Bluetooth connection or an active Wi-Fi connection, those can still be maintained. Whereas in deep sleep and light sleep, you know, your wireless communication is shut off. So when you wake up, you'd have to reestablish it. So my focus here is going to be on deep sleep and light sleep, and I guess to a lesser extent, hibernate. Automatic light and modem sleep to me is just more of a low power function. So I'm, I'm not going to cover that. Maybe in a future one, I will. What are some of the wake up sources? So we have a function that allows us to go into sleep. And before we go into sleep, we specify wake up sources. And what's nice about deep sleep or light sleep is the ESP32 lets you configure more than one wake up source. So you can use two different pins, two different logic levels. You could do a timer wake up along with a digital pin wake up. You can combine both of them together, which is a nice feature. You can see I have some of the wake up sources highlighted. I did that because those are ones that I'll feature in my example code in part two. So for deep and light sleep, so these are wake up sources that work for deep sleep and light sleep. We have the RTC or real time clock timer. We have a touchpad function, which relates to an RTC IO pin, or we have an ex external digital signal, you know, a level change from low to high or high to low. Once again, only for the RTC IO pins. And then you can use a ultra low power coprocessor function. And once I get, once again, that's a more advanced feature. So I'm not going to get into that, but that is an option where you can run assembly code and monitor things like an ADC to wake up. The first bullet, once again, covers deep sleep and light sleep. Now there's some more wake up sources for light sleep since there's more functionality going on. So with light sleep, you can use a GPIO pin wake up. So you could have a level change from low to high or high to low. Or you could have a UART signal and it lets you specify, for instance, you know, if you see three positive clock edges, or I should not say clock, signal edges wake up, right? So you can do a UART wake up, which is nice. One thing to keep in mind is you might be saying, well, what's the difference between a GPIO wake up and an RTC IO wake up? In the RTC IO wake up, you have to speci specifically configure the pin to be an RTC pin. And then when you wake up, if you want it to act like a GPIO pin with a pull-up resistor built in or an input or output function, you have to reconfigure it when you wake up. Whereas in light sleep mode, you can configure your GPIO pins, use one as a wake-up source, and when you wake up, it's still configured. Its configuration doesn't change. So that's that's sort of the difference, and that, that type of stuff is covered in more detail in the data sheet. Also, not every pin can be an RTC IO pin. Only certain pins are. So you have more options if you use a GPIO wake up versus an RTC IO wake up. Okay, here's a cutout from the ESP32 S3 module data sheet. And you can see it gives you some of the typical current consumptions for the different sleep modes. So at light sleep, it's showing 240 microamps, which is a pretty low. One thing to keep in mind though for light sleep is it depends how you configure the light sleep to get that current level. So they, in the data sheet, they mentioned that that's sort of the lowest current level. And then if you do certain things with flash memory and stuff like that, the current could go up. For deep sleep, you get very low current consumption, right? You get eight microamps, and we'll look at an example of that. And then for hibernation, where you're just, hibernation, once again, is really just deep sleep with your powering off some of the RTC functions. You can get seven microamps, so slightly less. And then they have another, I didn't list this in my sleep modes, but uh, and I didn't see a ton of documentation on this, but they they claim that you can also go into deep sleep. But before you go into deep sleep, you basically shut off everything, the RTC modules, or you specify them to be shut off, as well as the ULP coprocessor. 
And in that case, you can go in this power off state where you get very low current, but you have no way to wake up the chip. It's just asleep forever. The only way to wake up the chip is to somehow trigger a reset. But keep these current values in mind because we're going to show a demo of these uh, in a bit. So keep these in mind. Real quick, I just wanted to show the pin example. So I, the only reason I'm showing this is earlier I mentioned that not all pins are RTC pins. So if you're in deep sleep and you want to wake up from a touch uh, sensor setup, you have to use a touch pin that has RTC support. and uh, Or a logic level change, you have to use a pin that says RTC, right? Whereas you can use any GPIO pin for uh, the light sleep signal wake up. Okay, now I need to spend a little time on how I'm going to measure low level current. So I need to be able to measure down to eight or seven microamps of current. It's not that easy to measure low level current, right? I had a situation where I had a, a colleague that was um, trying to measure a low level current for a chip in sleep state. It wasn't this chip, it was a different one. And they were trying to use the current function on their handheld DMM. And whatever they did, they kept measuring 300 microamps and they were expecting a lower current value. I forget what they were trying to measure, but they weren't getting it. And uh, I was discussing it with them and I said, well, have you looked at the documentation for your handheld DMM? And sure enough, when we looked at the documentation, the current measurement function on the handheld DMM only could measure down to 300 microamps. So that's why anytime they measured, they were always seeing 300 microamps. So it's not easy to measure real low level current. The easiest way to do it and the lowest cost way to do it is to combine you know, a, a fairly accurate DMM voltage measurement capability. And when I say DMM, I mean digital multimeter. Some people call it a voltmeter. Uh, is to measure the voltage drop across a high accuracy resistor. So that way we can use Ohm's law to combine the known resistance with the measured voltage drop to get a current, right? So that's what I'm doing in this in this example. So I have a project coming up where I need to use the ESP32. I need it to run off of solar and battery power. So I wanna know the exact current values for the code I'm gonna run so I can properly size the battery in the, the solar panel. So that's, that's sort of the genesis of this. So then I set up this circuit so I can measure the current very accurately because I, I don't have a, a power supply that can measure current down to um, you know eight or seven microamps. So I did this setup. So that's a little bit of the background. So the idea here is I use two current sense resistors. Sometimes they're called shunts. And these are basically resistors that are made for current measurements. And they're they're made for current measurements because they have a high accuracy resistance value. They remain fairly stable, their resistance over temperature change. And, and the reason you have to be concerned about that is because if a resistor's temperature is changing as the current flows through it, its resistance actually is changing too. So that throws off the accuracy of the measurement. I also picked ones with high power values, much higher than what I'm actually going to put on them. That way they become, they stay pretty temperature stable. So I have one resistor, and I listed the model number here in case you're interested. That's 100 ohms, and I'm going to use that to measure my real low current. And then I have another resistor that's 0.1 ohms or 100 milli ohms to measure my what I'll call quote unquote normal current and my light sleep current. So basically, I have three different paths for current to flow to the ESP32. And I have switches, but really they're little shorting jacks that I can add or remove to control where the current flows through. And that way then I can connect my DMM. And that's what I'm showing here is in my circuit, I have a way to connect the DMM minus and plus to each resistor using pins. So that's how I have this set up. And then I have a path that's just you know a straight short right to there. And then I also have the ability to have all the switches open and use an external power source that has high, that good measurement capability to also measure the current. I tried to make this test circuit pretty robust. And the other thing I did is on my test design PCB, I also have other ICs. I have an IC to take the USB communication and convert it to UART and vice versa. So I can read data from the serial terminal as well as program the SV32. But I made sure to put that chip behind these uh, shunts that way I'm only measuring the current to the ESP32 because that's what I wanted to focus on here. If we only have switch two closed and we have switch one and three open and our DMM measures a one millivolt drop there, 
We can use Ohm's law, divide one millivolt by 0.1 ohms, and we know that we have 10 milliamps of current flowing through the SP32. Well, if we have switch one closed and switch two and three open and we measure a one millivolt drop, that actually means we have 10 microamps of current flowing through it, right? And 10 microamps is the range of the deep sleep. Now you might say, well, why not just use R1 all the time? Well, the problem is, is this value is too high that when we have a high current draw, we're gonna get too big of a voltage drop here and you won't get enough voltage to the chip and the chip will shut off or reset or go into like a brownout state. So that's why we have it this way. And so the way, what I can do is I can have switch three or two closed in normal mode. And then when I put, after I put it to sleep, I can open these switches and have this one closed. And that way the chip never shuts off and stays in deep sleep because I'm never cutting off power to it. So that's how this setup works. And we'll, we'll see the circuit in the video. Uh, for those of you on Patreon, I'll have all the design files for the circuit and the schematics and the bomb uh, on Patreon if you're interested in recreating this, this circuit yourself. Here we're looking at the example of the deep sleep, and there's my circuit configured. We'll pause it right there. So this is the circuit I just showed you. I showed you a basic schematic of it. But here's our ESP32 S3, of course. Here's my jumpers that I was calling switches, right? So I have two of them on and I have one of them off, and you can see it laying over here. And so you can see this is the 100 ohm sense resistor, and this is the 0.1 ohm sense resistor, and you can see uh, they're different sizes. But right now, current can flow through both of those, so we have two paths of current flowing to the chip. I'm starting this video with the chip already in a deep sleep state, and so if we wanna measure the current, we have to remove one of these uh, shorting posts because right now we have them both on. These two pins right here are for the DMM to measure the voltage across the shunt. So right now the chip is in deep sleep mode and we have two shunts, two switches closed. So I'm going to show you my DMM. And so we're not reading anything. We're just basically reading noise. So I pull the point one switch open. So now just the higher value current sense resistor is in the current path. So using my high accuracy DMM, I basically can measure 0.783. So let's just call it 0.78. If we take 100 ohms and divide this by 100 ohms, we get 7.8 microamps. So that aligns exactly with what the data sheet said. It said about eight microamps for deep sleep. And we're not in hibernation. We don't have any RTC modules shut off. So we are in just standard deep sleep mode. So we're getting about eight microamps, just like the data sheet said. So that's that's what we expected. Just one thing to note, not everybody might have you know, a DMM this accurate. You might have a handheld DMM or maybe just an ADC. In that case, you just have to use a higher value sense resistor, right? A thousand ohms or something like that. So just keep that in mind. So there's our current or there's our voltage, but we can convert that to current for 7.8 eight microamps. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put this shunt short back on for the point one, and I'm going to remove the one for the higher one, and I'm going to move my DMM post. And then I'm also going to show you this button. We'll see it in a second. There we go. What I have this set up for is a wake up from the RTC IO module. So when I press this button, it pulls the pin low and causes the chip to wake up from deep sleep. I move to a different current sense resistor, the 0.1, because the 100 ohm one will be too high to just show you the current when we wake up. So here we go. And there we go. So we see 3.5 millivolts. So if we do our Ohm's law with 0.1 Ohm resistance, we can see we get about 35 milliamps of current. So this is the deep sleep just woke up, it's going through the setup code and it'll go back to sleep. So it's just gonna be awake for a couple seconds and then we'll see it go back to sleep. There it goes. Right now, and, and that shunt that's on there now is way too low of a resistance value for that DMM to accurately measure the voltage drop, right? So that's why you're just kind of seeing noise on the DMM. Okay, that's deep sleep mode. Let's look at light sleep mode. Okay, here we're at uh, the second video. This is just gonna be showing light sleep mode real quick. You can see I only have one of our paths closed and that's the path through the 0.1 ohm resistor. 
We can't do light sleep through the 100 ohm resistor because that's too high of a value. And we don't even need to because our DMM has enough resolution to use this current sense resistor. So with light sleep, we can just use this one current sense resistor and we don't have to jump around between them. So we're already in light sleep mode. And you can see we have 0.21 millivolts. So at first that looks good, but if we do the Ohm's law math and we divide that by 0.1 Ohm resistor, that's 2.1 millivolts, or I should say, excuse me, that's 2.1 milliamps. If you remember from the data sheet, we should be getting about 240 microamps. Now they have different values if you configure things differently, but even with those, those different configurations, I should still be getting less current than this. And so this is actually something I have not figured out yet. I verified this with another type of measurement device to make sure that I wasn't messing up in my setup. Uh, I double checked the data sheet. I double checked the API. Anyway, this is basically what I came up with my experiment that I'm getting a higher current than I expected on light sleep. Now, what's nice is two milliamps is still pretty low, but it's not what the data sheet says. Uh, but if anybody has any input or thinks they might know what the issue is, or if anybody from Expressif is watching, uh, I'm not getting the expected current I expect in light sleep. Okay, the last thing I wanted to show before I wrap up is I do have a power supply that can digitize current. Uh, and so I captured a current profile that I thought you might be interested in sharing. Now, this power supply is not able to measure current very low in the sleep modes but I can use it to capture the dynamic current switching from awake to sleep. And I just kind of wanted to show you that a lot of times when you're using a device that takes average measurements, you don't see the fact that the current is actually fairly dynamic. And so what happens is, is this is code that actually connects to Wi-Fi, gets the time from the internet, like what time it is, and then goes into deep sleep or light sleep. And so we'll see this code in part two. But I just wanted to give you an idea of you know, the fact that current is not really constant a lot of times in these microcontrollers. So you can see these spikes. A lot of these spikes are related to the Wi-Fi communication, right? That's that's going to be your highest current consumption, whether you're using Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. That's when the ESP32 is going to be in its highest current consumption state. Some of these big spikes are most likely transmit current. And then some of the smaller spikes are most likely to receive current, right? Because you need more power to transmit data than you do to receive it. And uh, I do capture some example current. So you can see M2 is measuring about 39.6 milliamps, which is real close to 35 milliamps, is which we saw when we were in our sort of idle or starting state when we were not doing much. And then I grabbed one of these current pulses, which is almost 400 uh, milliamps of current, which is probably the Wi-Fi signal combined with some basic operations in the background. And then after that, we go to sleep, and that's where you see this low current with some noise on it. But anyway, I thought it might be interesting just to uh, share. And that's all for part one. If you have any questions or comments, please use the comment section below. If you have anything to add or anything you think I missed, or anything you think I might be doing wrong for light sleep, let me know. And of course, in part two, we'll dive into the code. See you back for part two. Thanks for watching.